Thanks. So almost exactly a month ago, the first documented case of Ebola arrived here in the United States. And it was isolated just four miles from where we're sitting today in Dallas. That caused a lot of concern, as it should have. Ebola is a serious disease. The epidemic in West Africa right now is a, a very serious problem. But I want to start today by putting this in perspective for you. In that intervening period of time, four people have been made sick. One of them has died, the original patient. Two of the nurses who were caring for him who got sick have recovered fully. Within about six months, my guess, is that there will be an effective vaccine for Ebola. In the meantime, if you don't want to contract Ebola, the list is actually pretty simple. You need to avoid contact of your bare skin with the blood or other excretions of a person who's desperately ill with the disease. For most of us, that's going to be pretty simple to do. But suppose I told you that there's a different epidemic going on. It's been going on for years. And to avoid this epidemic, your list is longer and harder. You have to avoid skin knees. You have to avoid a shaving cut. Suppose I told you that in the month we've been worried about Ebola, this epidemic has made 167,000 people here in the United States sick, very sick. Of those people, almost 2,000 have died. These are infections that are caused by drug-resistant bacteria, bacteria that are impervious to antibiotics. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. For a variety of technical reasons, there's not going to be a vaccine anytime soon, really for the foreseeable future. What we need to treat these infections are antibiotics. We need a lot of them. We need a steady supply. And yet we're in a position now where the number of antibiotics that are effective is going down, not up. So I'm going to talk to you today about how I got interested in this and what we can do to change that. I first got interested when I heard a talk in 1996 Summertime, beautiful New Hampshire setting by this guy, Chris Walsh, one of my scientific heroes. And he was talking about a biochemical problem that was, at a scientific level, fascinating. And his team at Harvard had unraveled it and, and presented the, the, the bottom line. And as a scientist, I was really fascinated. As a citizen, as a member of our community, I was terrified because what Chris was describing was the loss or the pr prospective loss of the last effective antibiotic we had for a certain class of infection. And the thought hit me. We're on the brink of a post-antibiotic era. And it was news to me. I figured it would be news to a lot of people. It worried me. To understand why I was worried, why a lot of people were worried at that point, we have to go back to the beginning of the antibiotic era to understand what the pre-antibiotic era was like. And I'll take you back to a case in 1942 a little girl showed up at the Mayo Clinic into the ER, four years old. She had a massive staph infection. And I thought long and hard about showing you some photos. They're just too disturbing. So I'm just going to describe it. The whole left of her face was swollen up. She had a wound right here. She got this by pricking herself with a needle, sewing needle. When she rolled into the ER, the docs took one look at her and told her parents there was nothing they could do and they should make funeral arrangements. That was a very common prognosis before antibiotics were prevalent. Well, it turned out the Mayo Clinic was one of a few laboratories in the United States then that had access to a precious new drug called penicillin. And one of the researchers there heard about the girl in the ER and came down and started administering penicillin to her. After three days, she looked like she does on the left. You can see she's still very sick, but she's getting much better. The two photos on the right are that little girl when she was discharged from the hospital 10 days later. So not only did she not die, she grew up, she had kids, grandkids, and great-grandkids. There are people alive on this planet today because she got penicillin in 1942. That's a remarkable story. That was the beginning of the antibiotic era. And you can understand why people were very excited. We had finally cured a fatal disease. That's pretty rare in medicine. That's a really rare event if you think about it. We've been struggling with diseases like this since we walked out of caves, and here we had a cure. And it worked. It worked so beautifully. And all of a sudden, we had a lot of antibiotics, and people that used to be dying of strep throat and skin knees and cuts were living long and productive and happy lives. And there was a sense of victory. We'd won. We had it. We're done. Got it. We could move on to the next problem. 
which was all well and good, but nobody told the bugs that. And they kept right on growing and mutating. And then we got some news from this guy. This is Charles Darwin. Turns out he was right. Evolution, mutation, natural selection, those are very real processes. They work in every biological system we've ever studied, and they work really well and quickly in bacteria. So to give you a sense of that, I'm just gonna show you a little time lapse here. This is three individual bacteria, and we're gonna watch them grow over the next four hours. Bacteria that are well fed and warm can double roughly every 20 minutes. So after an hour, you've got a bunch. After four hours, you completely filled up the microscope slide. They generate new copies of themselves so fast, it's crazy. And every time they do it, they have to copy their DNA, the instructions that tell them what to do, how to grow, how to eat. They have about a million pieces of DNA, a million bits of individual information. They copy it with a lot of fidelity, but not perfect fidelity. And once in a while, they make a mistake a mutation appears. If that mutation turns out to be beneficial to that bacterium, it's kept. The beneficial, bacteria, the beneficial mutations, and the most important, are the ones that change this relationship, the so-called lock and key relationship. If you want to think about how antibiotics really work, you can think about the bacteria as having a bunch of different proteins that are complicated machines, but each one of them has a weak point, and antibiotics work in the same way that a key works by inserting itself into a very specific shape, a very specific spot, turning something off or on. It doesn't really matter, but it screws up the bacteria's ability to function like it normally does, and the bug dies. But when these mutations crop up, if they impact the shape of that lock in the bacteria, they can make the antibiotics ineffective. That's how bacteria become resistant to antibiotics. And it happens all the time. It happens just as a matter of course of the life cycle of these bugs, no matter what we do. So our job really is not to worry so much about that, which is gonna happen one way or another, but to make sure we have plenty of these. We need plenty of antibiotics. We need a lot of them and we need a steady supply. And yet, in 96, Chris Walsh told me we were just about to run out of one of the most important ones. It was gonna become useless. So I got interested in that. Then in a real sense, that talk changed my life. A year after that, I quit my job working on uh, blood pressure medicine, and I went into a startup that was focused solely on antibiotics. And we worked, and we worked really hard. And there were three or four other companies working alongside us, and it wasn't so much a competition as we were all racing the bacteria. We weren't competing with each other. So my team developed a drug that's called Televancin. It treats the resistant bacteria that Chris was worried about, which are a form of Staph aureus, MRSA. Probably some of you have heard of it. Some of you may have had it or you've had kids with it because you can get it really easily with skin knees. Televancin's, I think, my proudest achievement as a scientist, really uh, hands down. And I was so happy we did that and other groups succeeded. And so in the late 90s, we had this burst of activity in MRSA and everything seemed pretty good. But it wasn't because the macro trends that had taken us to the late 90s and taken us right to the brink were still in force, and they were moving at a brisk clip. So here's, a, here's one of the macro trends I want to talk to you about. Pharma, like almost every other business, the pharmaceutical industry has undergone a period of intense consolidation over the last 20 years. In 1989, there were 27 separate pharmaceutical companies. In 2002, there were seven. So you've gone from a really large collection of folks working in the field of antibiotics, amongst other areas of medicine, down to just seven. More than that, the seven that still exist are really big, and they have certain need to generate high-value drugs. Well, here's a paradoxical thing about antibiotics. They're not that valuable as products because they work too well. Think about it. You have a bacterial infection. I give you 10 days of antibiotics. You take a pill a day. You've taken 10 pills. You're better. You're done. Cured. Decades of a good life lay ahead of you. If I give you a blood pressure medicine, you take a pill a day for the rest of your life. Now, I'm in a for-profit business. Guess which one I'm going to do? There's nothing nefarious about that. That's just a place where the free market kind of falls down. It's a classic market failure. So you had that. On top of that, you had the FDA. The FDA has a very difficult job. Any new drug that comes before them will have typically 
let's say 30,000 pages of data they have to review. On top of the amount of science they have to look at to decide if the drug is safe and effective, they have a tough boss. They have to report to Congress in various ways, and Congress is a body with mood swings. <laughs> I think it's safe to say. And regarding the FDA, Congress goes back and forth between where are all the new drugs for you know, cancer, HIV, to how in the heck could you have let this horrible toxic thing on the market that two people got sick from? So right in the late 90s, when Chris was discovering what he discovered, Congress went into a very long period of, why did you let these toxic drugs on the market? The result of that was very predictable. The FDA hunkered down and said, okay, we're gonna make the bar higher. Antibiotic approvals, partly because of the FDA, partly because there were fewer people making them, plummeted. It's exactly the wrong time. All right, so not looking good. Meanwhile, we're not taking good care of the antibiotics we do have. So we're doing stupid things as a society. We're adding them to cattle feed, to fatten the cattle up. That's great if you have a limitless supply, but if they're precious drugs that save human lives, that's a dumb thing to do because that's a recipe for breeding resistant bacteria. Why do that? All right, well, as I mentioned, the bugs don't really care what we're up to and they didn't take any kind of a break. So almost as soon as we got ahead on the MRSA front, we started losing ground with a new superbug called CRE. And we watched this very carefully at my last company where we focused only on antibiotics. And we prayed it wouldn't spread. In 2001, it was in one state. As of this year, it's in 47 states. This is a nasty bug. We're down to one antibiotic that can treat it. And that one's starting to fade. It's a serious problem. But there's a way out. So in the middle part of the last decade, we began a turning point. Like all turning points, it's a little bit hard to recognize when you're in the middle of it because there's so much chaos and bad news. But like a lot of good turning points, it begins with passionate advocates. So I'm gonna tell you about a couple of these. One was the Infectious Disease Society of America. They published this report in 2004 with a disarmingly simple title, Bad Bugs, No Drug. Guess who they sent this to? Congress. Pretty simple to understand. Journalists got on the case. There's some really good science journalists out there. I, not many of them work for the major networks as far as I can tell, but if you read, <laughs> maybe we can edit that out. If you, um, if you read Maren McKenna, for example, at Wired, she's fantastic. She's been on this since 2004 talking about superbugs. Uh, the Pew Charitable Trust, a nonprofit organization that's done really brilliant work to analyze the market failure and explain it in terms that everybody can understand. This is why people have drifted out of the space. This is why society cannot allow that to happen. We just need to change the market incentives. People get back into the space. And then most recently, President Obama uh, got wind of this. His, um, his uh, director of the FDA is really, really good, and she's been focused on this, Peggy Hamburg. Um, so the president convened this uh, council of advisors in science and technology to look at, among other things, antibiotic resistance. I had the privilege of participating in one of those meetings. It was a, it was a very interesting meeting. The report just came out two months ago or so. It received a lot of mainstream press, and I think some good things are going to happen. Now, Congress being Congress, they've taken a little UE, um, and they've begun passing things, which is great. They've responded to reasoned arguments about why we need to do things. So we have the GAIN Act, the ADAPT Act, the DISARM Act. I'm not gonna get into the particulars here, but all of these are meant to change the market incentives and the way we get antibiotics from the lab to the clinic. They're all important. Of them, only GAIN is passed. Now I'm gonna close um, with a personal anecdote. It's my son, Theo, my youngest son. We were on a hike, uh, it's three, four years ago, near our house in Northern California. Um, Right after I took this photo, he leaned all the way back and just rolled in the leaves, as you do. Um, at some point during that rolling around, he got a bite in the back of his ear. Don't know what kind of bug, might have been a tick. But the point is he broke the skin. The Staph aureus is a bacteria that lives on the skin. We all have it. As long as your skin's not broken, no problem. Six hours later, I was sitting with Theo in the ER and he had a swelling on the back of his head looked like a baseball, 
really red, really hot to the touch. I'd been working in MRSA for 15 years at that point. I knew exactly what it was, and I was terrified. Now, Theo's with us today. That's him last month. He attended TEDx yesterday. Why was he able to do that? Because he met in the ER the exact same set of conditions that that little girl met in Mayo in 1942. We got there with a staph infection, and we had effective antibiotics to treat it. That's what we need to do for the next generation of kids and the one after that. The problem's not going to go away. Bacteria multiply, they mutate, they get around antibiotics. We need to keep making new antibiotics. So I'm here to ask for your help today. You can do a couple of things. The first thing you can do is learn more about this, all right? I might recommend just turning off the television, which is 24-7 Ebola, <laughs> and find something to read that's a little bit more measured. You know, read something from Pew Charitable Trust. Look at what Mary McKenna has written. She writes beautifully and carefully about complex technical subjects. You can act. You have two powerful kinds of influence in the United States. You can vote. Maybe even better, you can call your congresspeople and tell them you're going to vote, and they need to do something about this problem. And you can choose what you buy. If you don't like the practices that are used to raise some of our foods, don't buy them. And then this is really the most important thing, and this is what I want to leave you with. You can encourage. So if you know kids out there who are interested in science, encourage them to become scientists. This country has more than enough lawyers and bankers. <laughs> we really do. But we don't have enough young scientists. And from them, given enough time, we will get miracles. Thank you.